In this new versus series, we take a look at two greats of basketball history as we analyze their skills, achievements, and career totals, ending with a conclusion on who is the greater basketball player overall. Today, our matchup is the round mound of rebound, Charles Barkley, versus the mailman, Carl Malone. One legend built his legacy as a member of the 76ers, Suns, and Rockets, while the other spent almost the entirety of his career with the Utah Jazz before closing it out with the Lakers. Starting with the basics, Barkley was listed as a 6'6 power forward, although he's probably more accurately around 6'4", and he typically weighed around 252 pounds. Malone was a 6'9 power forward who weighed around 250 pounds. We'll compare these two greats with five major categories, which sometimes vary in categories depending on positions and play styles. In this video, for these two power forwards, the categories are scoring, efficiency, rebounding, defense, and accolades. First off, scoring. Both of these legends were almost always their team's leading scorer, as Malone had a career scoring average of 25 points. He didn't win any scoring titles, but he is currently ranked second among the NBA's all-time scoring leaders, and his career high was 61 points against the Bucks in 1990. Malone also averaged 24.7 points in his playoff career, which puts him in 20th place on the all-time list. Barkley had a career scoring average of 22.1 points, and he didn't win any scoring titles either. He's currently ranked in 26th place on the NBA's all-time scoring list, and his career high was 56 points against the Warriors in 1994. His career playoff scoring average was 23 points, which currently ranks him 33rd all-time. Malone was one of the more dominant and consistent scorers of basketball history, who was quite frequently the beneficiary of a John Stockton assist, whether in the fast break or from the pick and roll. He was one of the more incredibly strong players of the game, who fiercely attacked the rim and had the power to assert his will. He also had a very smooth and reliable mid-range jumper. People often don't recognize how great of a scorer the mailman actually was. His era wasn't really the most statistically productive time in history. In the entirety of the 1990s decade, only one player other than Michael Jordan averaged over 30 points per game in a season, and that was Karl Malone in the 89-90 season. Here's another way of putting his elite scoring in context. Karl Malone has no scoring titles in the entirety of his playing career, but that isn't necessarily his fault, as it's actually just a byproduct of playing in the same era as Michael Jordan. As I said, Malone has no scoring titles. But if Michael Jordan did not exist, Malone would have five of them, which would then give him the second most in NBA history behind only Wilt Chamberlain. He also would have a couple more championships and another MVP, but I digress. Barkley could score well in his own right, as he was an absolute force in transition, especially in his days with Philadelphia. Barkley would also bully opponents in the post, and was famous for slowly backing down his defender until he was in an ideal position to score. He was so dominant and efficient at this that the NBA created the five-second back-to-the-basket rule to try to discourage players like Barkley from abusing it to such an extent. As good as Barkley was, he was almost never quite as explosive of a score as Malone was. I'm sure the luxury of having John Stockton as his point guard for basically his entire career definitely helped. But still, whether that's true or not, the gap is too big to make up for Barkley. Scoring goes to Karl Malone. Second up is rebounding. This is an area where both power forwards were very solid, as they both are currently within the top 20 of the all-time list. Although Malone is significantly higher on the list, that's mostly due to his longevity, which, to his credit, required maintained conditioning and athleticism. With that being said, Barkley gained his round mound of rebound nickname for a reason. As he had a higher career rebounding average than Malone, he has a rebounding title, which Malone does not, and in every season of his career other than his rookie season where he played less than 30 minutes per game, he averaged over 10 rebounds per game. Even in his less fondly remembered years with the Rockets, Barkley was still a beast on the boards, easily out-rebounding Hakeem Olajuwon in all of his four seasons there. I could break this down from many different angles, but at the end of the day, it's an easy decision. Rebounding goes to Charles Barkley. Third up is efficiency, and at first, I was going to include turnovers in this area, but long story short, it's basically a tie. You may not have known this, but Karl Malone has the most turnovers in NBA history, at least until LeBron surpasses him this upcoming season. Not necessarily a claim that Malone should be proud of. 
especially for a power forward, he did have a bit of an issue protecting the basketball. But with that being said, a major contributing factor to his turnover total is his longevity. If everyone had a career as long as Malone's, then there would be a ton of players ahead of him. Barkley had some of these issues as well, as both players averaged the same amount of turnovers over the course of their career. So how about efficiency in terms of shooting the basketball? Well, Malone was certainly reliable, especially considering the amount of shots he took per game. For his career, he shot a solid 51.6% from the field and a decent 74.2% from the free throw line. He shot only 27.4% from three point range, but that stat is basically irrelevant as Malone never shot that many three pointers as it wasn't a regular part of his game. Now as solid as Malone was at effectively scoring the basketball, Barkley was an all time great at it. For his career, he shot 54.1% from the field. That's incredible for a season, let alone a career. To put in context how amazing that is, listen to this stat. Out of the top 50 scores on the all-time list, he's the most efficient non-center from the field in NBA history at 54.1%. If you include centers, he was third, behind Kareem, who had the most indefensible shot in NBA history, and behind Shaq, who basically spent his entire career mostly dunking the basketball. Now the crazy thing about Barkley is that as historically great as he was from an efficiency standpoint, he could have been even better. Barkley's Achilles heel was his abusive obsession with shooting three-pointers. There is no worse three-point shooter than Charles Barkley. I'm not even being sarcastic when I say that. Objectively speaking, of all players who shot at least 1,000 three-pointers in their career, Barkley is literally the most inefficient shooter in NBA history. For some reason, despite being so terrible from distance, he simply couldn't stop shooting them, even reaching as high as 25th place in the league in three-point attempts in 1993. It was like he was salivating every time he got around the three-point line and just couldn't help himself. Some will say that shooting the outside shot helps keep defenses honest, but when you're literally the worst shooter ever, let's be real, you're not keeping any defenses honest, because they can simply give you the Ben Simmons treatment and beg you to shoot. Here's a funny stat that again emphasizes this issue. In five straight seasons from 1987 to 1991, Barkley led the entire league in efficiency from two-point range. But in none of those seasons did he lead the league in overall field goal percentage because he shot so many damn three-pointers. With all that being said, efficiency easily goes in favor of Barkley even though he could have chilled a bit on perimeter shots. Next up is defense, and neither of these forwards were scrubs in that area. Both averaged just about the same amount of steals and blocks over the course of their careers. But with Barkley's roughly 6'4 frame, he was a bit undersized in the paint, and wasn't always able to contest the offensive player's shots. Malone, on the other hand, was a strong 6'9 monster defensively in the interior, and was very good at staying in front of his man and giving very few easy looks. Although I definitely wouldn't describe Barkley as a bad defender, he never made any all-defense teams throughout his career. Malone, on the other hand, made four all-defense teams, and three of those were first team. Simply and concisely, Malone takes the defensive category. Last on the list of categories is accolades, and both of these greats had plenty of them. Malone for his career was the 1997 and 1999 league MVP. He made 14 all-star teams, 14 all-NBA teams, four all-defense teams, and made two trips to the NBA Finals. In his 19 seasons, he averaged 25 points, 10.1 rebounds, 3.6 assists, and 1.4 steals on 51.6% shooting. Barkley was the 1993 league MVP. He made 11 all-star teams, 11 all-NBA teams, he was the 1987 rebounding champion, and he made one trip to the NBA Finals. In his 16 seasons, he averaged 22.1 points, 11.7 rebounds, 3.9 assists, and 1.5 steals on 54.1% shooting. Ultimately, this is a very tough decision, and I think it's why so many people requested this video. It might seem controversial to most of you, but for myself personally, Charles Barkley gets the edge as the greater player. When both guys were at their best, I think Barkley was slightly the more dominant overall player. He was also incredibly unique, as he was one of the most efficient scorers in NBA history despite the fact that he was a significantly undersized power forward. I've heard it said this way, and I definitely agree with this statement. Malone had the better career, Barkley was the better player. I also can't completely ignore the aspect of John Stockton. 
Malone had the luxury of having one of the greatest facilitators of all time as his point guard for almost the entirety of his career. Barkley didn't have that same luxury for his entire career, and that's saying something when he already has a resume that's putting him on the same level as Karl Malone. I can only imagine the kind of career numbers he would have put up if someone like Stockton was his point guard for basically his whole career. Now let me make this clear, there's a reason why these greats were compared so much throughout their careers, and why the comparisons continue even years after they've both retired. It's because it's very close, and I certainly won't fault you if you disagree with my conclusion, but I would like to know why. Let me know in the comments section who you think was the greater player, Chuck or the Mailman. Today, our matchup is the Diesel, Shaquille O'Neal, versus the Dream, Hakeem Olajuwon. One legend built his legacy as a member of six different franchises, while the other spent almost the entirety of his career with the Houston Rockets before closing it out with the Raptors. Starting with the basics, Shaq was listed as a 7'1 center who typically weighed around 325 pounds. Hakeem was a 7'0 center who weighed around 255 pounds. We'll compare these two greats with five major categories, which sometimes vary in categories depending on positions and play styles. In this video for these two all-time great big men, the categories are scoring, efficiency, rebounding, defense, and accolades. First off, scoring. Both of these legends are on the list of the greatest scores in NBA history, as Shaq is in 8th place with over 28,000 points. The Diesel also has two scoring titles in his career and has a career average of 23.7 points. His career high was 61 points against the Clippers in 2000, and he averaged 24.3 points for his career in the playoffs, which ranks him 24th on the all-time list. Now, Hakeem is in 11th place on the NBA's all-time scoring list with nearly 27,000 points. He had no scoring titles and had a career average of 21.8 points. His career high was 52 points against the Nuggets in 1990, and he averaged 25.9 points over his career in the playoffs, which ranks him in 11th place on the all-time list. For Shaq, you really can't put it perfectly into words just how dominant he was offensively in his prime, but you had to live through that era to completely understand it. Some of the tallest and largest centers in the league he simply tossed aside like they were ragdolls. Night after night, defenses knew exactly what the game plan was and how the offense would be run through Shaq, and they still couldn't stop him. Shaq was so good offensively that he often made the spot-up shooters on his team significantly better. When the defense would have to send a second or even third defender to collapse on Shaq, often the open teammates were guys like Nick Anderson, Brian Shaw, Rick Fox, and Robert Ory. Many of these role players made names for themselves by being the beneficiaries of Shaq demanding so much attention. While Shaq essentially played bully ball, Hakeem was likely the most offensively skilled big man to ever lace him up. He had an all-time great mid-range game, fadeaway, and jump hook. I won't even say arguably for this next one, it's simply a fact. Hakeem has the greatest footwork of any center who's ever played the game. He was the finesse to Shaq's power, the grace to O'Neal's authority. Although you could certainly make the case that Hakeem scored in more variety of ways, you also have to acknowledge that two points is two points, regardless of how you get them. Hakeem may have been more talented offensively, but whatever Shaq was lacking in skills and talent, he easily made up for it with power and brute force. Shaq has more scoring titles, is higher on the all-time scoring list, and has a higher career average. Scoring goes to Shaquille O'Neal. Second up is rebounding. Neither of these centers would you describe as goats of rebounding, but both of them did their jobs and did it consistently for a long period of time. For his career, Shaq averaged 10.9 rebounds, getting as high as 13.6 in 2000, which was his near-unanimous MVP season. He never once led the league in rebounding, which is a bit surprising considering his size, strength, and how long he played. Regardless, his consistency was good enough for him to end up in the 15th spot on the all-time rebounds list. Now, Hakeem was significantly lighter than Shaq and wasn't able to impose his will with sheer force to the extent that Shaq was. But Hakeem was very good at reading the floor, boxing out, and anticipating the direction of the rebound. Over his career, he averaged 11.1 .1 rebounds, which is just slightly ahead of Shaq. He also has two rebounding titles, getting as high as 14 rebounds per game in 1990. He's also two spots ahead of Shaq on the all-time rebounds list. No matter which statistic or measure you look at in this category, it's extremely close. But in almost every instance, Hakeem has a small edge, which means rebounding goes ever so slightly in the favor of Elijah Wan. Third up is efficiency. 
Getting in an ideal position to score was Shaq's specialty. He couldn't consistently hit anything outside of 10 feet, but he really didn't need to considering his ability to assert his will in the low post. With Shaq's baby hooks, his dunks, and all the other ways he scored in the interior, he shot a remarkable 58.2% from the field for his career, and led the league in field goal percentage a whopping 10 times. His career 58.2% is the 7th highest field goal percentage in NBA history, and it's significantly higher than Akeem Olajuwon's 51.2%. With that being said, being an efficient player is a lot more than simply field goal percentage. One of the major aspects is free throw shooting. When the opposing team makes you earn the two points, can you punish them from 15 feet out? To say this was a struggle for Shaq would be a massive understatement. He was one of the worst free throw shooters of all time, who shot a terrible 52.7% for his career. He was the worst free throw shooter in the entire league a baffling eight times throughout his career. Needless to say, the mid-range artist that was Hakeem Olajuwon shot a significantly more efficient 71.2% from the free throw line. And now, when you factor in both field goal percentage and free throw percentage, their true shooting percentage is much more comparable. Technically, from a pure numbers standpoint, Shaq still has the edge in true efficiency. But he was so terrible from the free throw line that there was plenty of instances during the final minutes of games where Shaq had to go to the bench on offense that way, the defense couldn't intentionally foul him and force him to make free throws. You can't be efficient if you're not even playing. So what small edge Shaq has over Akeem in true shooting percentage, he loses in my mind due to this fact. I have to call efficiency a tie between the two centers. Next up is defense, and every category has been pretty close up to this point, but this one is not. Throughout Shaq's career, he was a pretty good defensive anchor and rim protector for his teams. He averaged 2.3 blocks over his career, but he never once led the league in blocked shots. He also made just three all-defense teams. Hakeem Olajuwon has nearly as many Defensive Player of the Year awards as Shaq has all-defense team appearances. Hakeem had nine all-defense team appearances throughout his career, which is three times what Shaq had. He was an absolute dog when contesting shots, as he averaged 3.1 blocks over his career and is easily the all-time leader in recorded block shots. Just how big is the gap exactly? Well, he's ahead of second place on the all-time list by 541 blocked shots. To put that in perspective, in each of the last three seasons of the NBA, the leading shot blocker has finished with around 195 blocks in the season. That means Hakeem Olajuwon is just about three league-leading seasons of blocks ahead of the nearest competitor. Along with that, only 10 players in league history have won the Defensive Player of the Year award multiple times. Of those 10 players, no one averaged more points in his career than Akeem Olajuwon. Typically, the greatest rim protectors in NBA history are not also among the greatest scorers of all time, but Akeem Olajuwon and Wilt Chamberlain are the exceptions. It's also worth mentioning that Akeem averaged 1.7 steals over his career, which is incredibly high for someone who plays the center position and is nearly three times what Shaq averaged. So yeah, no surprises here as defense easily goes to Akeem. Last on the list of categories is accolades, and both of these legends had a ton of them. Shaq was a four-time champion, a three-time finals MVP, and he was the 2000 league MVP. He made 15 all-star teams, 14 all-NBA teams, and three all-defense teams. He was also a two-time scoring champion. In his 19 seasons, he averaged 23.7 points, 10.9 rebounds, 2.5 assists, 0.6 steals, and 2.3 blocks on 58.6 true shooting percentage. Hakeem was a two-time champion, a two-time finals MVP, and the 1994 league MVP. He made 12 all-star teams, 12 all-NBA teams, and 9 all-defense teams. He was a two-time defensive player of the year, two-time rebounding champion, and a three-time blocks champion. It's also worth mentioning that he achieved a quadruple double in the 1990 season and was only one assist shy of having a second one within the same month. In his 18 seasons, he averaged 21.8 points, 11.1 .1 rebounds, 2.5 assists, 1.7 steals, and 3.1 blocks on 55.3% true shooting percentage. As usual, it's really close in these versus videos, and in this video in particularly, there's so much to be said that we haven't already covered in these categories. Like how both of these big men were underrated passers, and how they each were some of the greatest clutch performers in playoff history. But at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, I personally rank Akeem Olajuwon slightly higher on the all-time list than Shaquille O'Neal. In my opinion, he's simply the more complete player, 
and he's legitimately in the argument for the title of greatest two-way player in NBA history. Yes, Shaq has twice as many championships as Hakeem does, but I also think that a part of that is the level of superstar support that they each had during their primes. This is an actual stat, and feel free to fact check me on this, but Hakeem Olajuwon is the only player in NBA history to lead his team to back-to-back -back championships without a second All-Star on the roster. You could argue that Clyde Drexler was an all-star caliber player in their second championship run, but he literally wasn't selected. And you and I both know that a young Kobe Bryant wasn't a borderline all-star in Shaq's second championship run, but he was a legit superstar. So here's my hot take. If you give Hakeem Olajuwon the talent Shaq had supporting him through his best years, like Penny Hardaway and Horace Grant in Orlando, a young Kobe and a multitude of shooters in LA, or Dwayne Wade at his absolute best in Miami, then Hakeem is getting at least as many championships as Shaq did, if not more. Today, our matchup is Allen the Answer Iverson versus George the Iceman Gervin. One legend spent the majority of his career playing in the NBA in the late 90s and throughout the 2000s, while the other played in the ABA and NBA throughout the 70s and 80s. Starting with the basics, Iverson was a 6-foot point guard slash shooting guard who weighed about 165 pounds. Gervin was a 6'7 shooting guard slash small forward who weighed about 180 pounds. We'll compare these two greats with five major categories, which are scoring, playmaking, efficiency, defense, and accolades. First off, scoring. It's no secret that both of these legends are among the greatest scorers in NBA history. Iverson had a career scoring average of 26.7 points. He won four scoring titles and his career high was 60 points against the Magic in 2005. Iverson also has the second greatest playoff scoring average in NBA history at 29.7 points, trailing only Michael Jordan. Gervin had a career scoring average of 25.1 points. He also won four scoring titles and his career high was 63 points against the New Orleans Jazz in 1978, and his career playoff scoring average was 26.5. Iverson was a volume shooting assassin and he spent the majority of his career carrying a 76ers offense with little offensive support. He had a smooth jump shot and was fearless when attacking the paint accompanied with an all-time great layup package. Thanks to Iverson's brave and aggressive nature, he was always among the league leaders in free throw attempts, averaging significantly more attempts over his career than Gervin did. Iverson was also an elite scorer for a significant amount of time. He averaged at least 25 points per game in 10 straight seasons, which only him and seven other players have ever accomplished. And unfortunately for Gervin, he wasn't all that close to being one of them. Now the Iceman did the majority of his damage in the mid-range and around the painted area. He's famously known as the player who made the finger roll famous, and he was overall just incredibly talented at finishing around the rim. He was never much of a perimeter shooter, averaging less than one three-point attempt per game over the course of his career. Overall, when you look at consistent scoring and the variety of ways they could do it, the edge goes slightly to Allen Iverson. Second up is playmaking. This is another area where the answer stands out. As famous and well-known as he was as a scorer, he often doesn't get enough credit for his solid passing abilities and court vision. He managed to make solid passes and get a ton of assists considering the amount of shots he was taking per game. On Iverson's career, he shot 21.8 shots per game and averaged 6.2 assists per game. His 21.8 shots is the fourth highest shots per game average in NBA history. Of the top 10 players with the highest shots per game average of all time, only one player averaged more assists per game over their career than Allen Iverson, which was Jerry West. Among these players are legends like Michael Jordan, Pistol Pete Maravich, and Rick Barry, and Iverson averaged more assists per game than all of them. He did this with his vision, but he was also one of the greatest ball handlers of all time, and he's extremely quick which often forced a second defender to help on Iverson, which naturally opened up his teammates for clean looks. Now, although Gervin's six foot seven frame was hard to defend, it's no secret that George often looked to make a play just for himself rather than his teammates as well. In the entirety of Gervin's career, he never once averaged at least four assists per game in a season. Facilitating certainly wasn't among his skill set. In Iverson's 14 years in the NBA, he never once averaged as few assists per game as Gervin did in his best season. With all of these things considered, playmaking clearly goes to Allen Iverson. Third up is efficiency, and although this has been an area where Allen Iverson has been criticized by some analytic-loving basketball fans, it's certainly not as bad as advertised. 
His career field goal percentage is 42.5%, but his true shooting percentage is very comparable to other greats like Russell Westbrook, Isaiah Thomas, and Carmelo Anthony. But on the other hand is Gervin, who wasn't just great at efficiently scoring, but he was one of the greatest ever in that criteria. An incredible fact about the Iceman is that other than LeBron James, he's the only wing player in NBA history to have a career average of over 25 points per game while shooting over 50% from the field for his career. Again, just LeBron and George Gervin. His best single season overall came in the 1979-1980 season where he averaged 33.1 points per game while shooting 52.8% from the field. Other than Michael Jordan, no wing player in NBA history has ever averaged that many points while shooting above 50% for a season, let alone Gervin's 52.8%. Iverson was a decent 78% from the free throw line, but Gervin for his career shot an elite 84.1%. In this area of efficiency, the edge is strongly given to George Gervin. Next is defense, which is a bit of a complicated aspect for these two greats. In the case of Iverson, he was often undersized, guarding players significantly taller and heavier than him, but at one point, he actually led the NBA in steals per game for three consecutive seasons. With that being said, he never once made an all-defense team appearance, and in large part, that was because most people could recognize that he wasn't a great on-ball defender, which Iverson himself has admitted. But he was good at jumping the passing lanes, which can be risky and sometimes resulted in a defensive breakdown for his team and a basket for the opponent. Gervin wasn't known to be an elite on-ball defender either, as he also never made an all-defense team appearance. But at the very least, he could be a decent help defender, and he was a bit of an underrated shot blocker, which in large part had to do with his long wingspan and his terrific leaping ability. He averaged 1.2 blocks over his career, reaching as high as 1.8 during the 73-74 season, which is significantly higher than most wing players. With all of those aspects considered, I have to call this one a tie between both stars. Last on the list of categories is accolades, and both of these greats had plenty of them. Iverson for his career was the 2001 league MVP. He was a four-time scoring champion, three-time steals champion, he made 11 all-star teams, seven all-NBA teams, and made one trip to the NBA Finals. In his 14 seasons, he averaged 26.7 points, 6.2 assists, 3.7 rebounds, and 2.2 steals on 42.5% shooting. Gervin was a four-time scoring champion. He made 12 All-Star teams, 7 All-NBA teams, and 2 All-ABA teams. But he never made it to the ABA or NBA Finals. For his career, he averaged 25.1 points, 5.3 rebounds, 2.6 assists, and 1 block on 50.4% shooting. With all aspects considered, ultimately, it's close. Very close. But I have to say that Allen Iverson is just slightly ahead of Gervin as the greater overall player, and the major separating factor is how Iverson can impact the game in a number of ways with his skill set of playmaking and distributing to go along with the fact that he's one of the greatest scores and especially playoff scores the game has ever seen. Today, our matchup is the big ticket, Kevin Garnett, versus the seven-foot sniper, Dirk Nowitzki. One legend built his legacy as a member of three different franchises, while the other spent the entirety of his career playing for the Mavericks. Starting with the basics, Garnett was listed as a 6'11 power forward who typically weighed around 240 pounds. Nowitzki was a 7-foot power forward who weighed around 245 pounds. We'll compare these two greats with five major categories, which sometimes vary in categories depending on positions and play styles. In this video, for these two all-time great forwards, the categories are scoring, efficiency, rebounding, defense, and accolades. Both of these greats made their mark as elite scorers in the league, as Garnett is in 18th place on the all-time scoring list with over 26,000 points. He has no scoring titles in his career and had a career average of 17.8 points. His career high was 47 points against the Suns in 2005, and he averaged 18.2 points for his career in the playoffs, which ranks him 112th on the all-time list. Now Dirk is in 6th place on the NBA's all-time scoring list with over 31,000 points. He also had no scoring titles and had a career average of 20.7 points. His career high was 53 points against the Rockets in 2004, and he averaged 25.3 points over his career in the playoffs, which ranks him in 15th place on the all-time list. Garnett was a very good ball handler for a 6'11 frame, and he was excellent at creating his own shot. He had a smooth mid-range jump shot that was extremely hard to defend considering his high above-the-head release point. 
Garnett always played within the flow of the offense for his team and wasn't the type to try to force any bad shots, as he never averaged more than 20 shot attempts per game. With that being said, his best season scoring the basketball was the 03-04 season, the year which he won the league MVP, and he averaged 24.2 points on the season. During the majority of his prime, he was typically averaging just barely over 20 points per game. Now Dirk, on the other hand, had an even more difficult shot to defend, as the 7-footer consistently utilized his signature fadeaway, which is right up there with Kareem Skyhook as some of the most difficult shots to defend in NBA history. Dirk really slowed down quite a bit as he aged, but especially in his youth, he had a pretty quick first step and was capable of finishing strong on the paint. But obviously, what he was known for more than anything was his elite perimeter shooting, as he was consistently among the league leaders and three-pointers made. With all of these skills and abilities at his disposal, he was frequently among the elite scorers in the NBA. His highest seasonal average was 26.6 points in the 05-06 season, and he had six entire seasons where he averaged more points than Kevin Garnett's best season. I could delve into more aspects, but the truth is, this category isn't all that close as Nowitzki comfortably takes the scoring comparison. Second up is rebounding, and this is another category that isn't all that close. To put it simply, Dirk was not an elite rebounder. He wasn't known to play the game of basketball very physically, and it certainly wasn't his style to bang on the boards and fight for loose balls. For his career, he averaged just 7.5 rebounds per game. In his 21 seasons, he never once averaged at least 10 rebounds per game, which is pretty stunning considering the amount of minutes he played and considering the fact that he was a 7-foot power forward. Now KG is the complete opposite of that, as he was an elite rebounder who was known for his physical nature around the painted area. For his 21-year career, he averaged 10 rebounds per game, getting as high as 13.9 in 2004. In four straight seasons from 2004 to 2007, he led the league in rebounds per game, that four straight seasons is the third longest streak in NBA history, behind only the streaks of Dennis Rodman and Moses Malone. No need to drive the point any further home, as rebounding clearly goes to Kevin Garnett. Third up is efficiency. Now Kevin Garnett was a strong finisher and trailer in the fast break, but he mixed in plenty of jump shots into his game, and even with that perimeter aspect, he shot nearly 50% for his career at a solid 49.7%. He was also relatively a pretty good free throw shooter for his size, as he shot 78.9% from the free throw line. Now Dirk shot the ball more often than Garnett did, and perimeter shooting was an even more significant part of his game than it was for KG, as Dirk shot 47.1% for his career, which is slightly lower than Garnett's career total. But as I've said in past videos, efficiency is a whole lot more than simply field goal percentage. Not only was Dirk among the best three-point shooters in the league, but he was also one of the best free throw shooters, hitting 87.9% of his attempts over his career. In 2006, Dirk had a 50-40-90 season, which less than 10 players have ever done in league history, and Dirk is the only official 7-footer to ever accomplish that feat. True shooting percentage factors in all kinds of shots on the basketball court, and when we look at that advanced stat, the edge is now in Dirk's favor. And when you consider that Dirk shot the ball more and scored more than KG as well, then you begin to see how there's really no way to make a solid argument in favor of KG on this one. Efficiency goes to Dirk Nowitzki. Next up is defense, and this one has the biggest gap of all of the categories. I certainly wouldn't describe Dirk as a bad defender, especially in his early years, as he had the size and length to contest many shots, and he did have some quickness to keep up with the offensive player in front of him. But as he got older, that quickness declined dramatically, and once Dirk was into his 30s, it was very common to see reoccurring blowbys, as he no longer had the lateral speed to challenge the offensive player, and many times, he was the last player to get back on defense after the offensive possession. Garnett, on the other hand, was one of the greatest defensive players of all time. He was a great on-ball defender, he was extremely tenacious, was a solid shot blocker, and had extremely quick hands for a big man, getting more steals than players who typically played the position. You could also argue that his intensity and leadership was contagious on the defensive end for his team, and it was common for him to lead with hustle and heart on that end of the court. He was the league's defensive player of the year in 2008 with the Boston Celtics, and for his career, he made a total of 12 all-defense teams. Dirk, unfortunately, never made a single all-defense team. What is even more impressive for KG is the fact that he was first-team all-defense a total of nine times. 
That's tied with Michael Jordan, Gary Payton, and Kobe Bryant for the most first-team selections in NBA history. I think you get the point. Garnett authoritatively takes the defensive category. Last on the list of categories is accolades, and both of these legends had plenty of them. Dirk was an NBA champion, the 2011 Finals MVP, and he was the 2007 League MVP. He made 14 All-Star teams and 12 All-NBA teams. In his 21 seasons, he averaged 20.7 points, 7.5 rebounds, 2.4 assists, 0.8 steals, and 0.8 blocks on 57.7 true shooting percentage. Garnett was an NBA champion and he was the 2004 league MVP. He made 15 All-Star teams, 9 All-NBA teams, and 12 All-Defense teams. He was the 2008 Defensive Player of the Year and he won 4 rebounding titles. In his 21 seasons, he averaged 17.8 points, 10 rebounds, 3.7 assists, 1.3 steals, and 1.4 blocks on 54.6 true shooting percentage. In terms of efficiency and production, Dirk is clearly the better scorer. But as far as the better overall player, the more accomplished player, and the greater player on the all-time list, those are all titles I give in favor to Kevin Garnett. If Dirk was also an elite defender, then I could certainly argue in his favor. But the big ticket simply impacted the game in way too many ways to overlook. In NBA history, only five players have ever won both the MVP award and the Defensive Player of the Year award during their career. Those players are Akeem Olajuwon, David Robinson, Giannis, Michael Jordan, and you guessed it, Kevin Garnett. To even further emphasize how much of a unique and special all-around talent KG was, consider this stat. In the totality of his career, he has over 25,000 points, 10,000 rebounds, 5,000 assists, 1,500 steals, and 1,500 blocks. Garnett is the only player in NBA history to hit all of these milestones literally no one else. Giannis may get there many years from now, but as of right now, Garnett stands alone. I've said it once and I'll say it again, I think Kevin Garnett is extremely underrated and should be in the discussion of the greatest power forwards in NBA history. And I believe the only reason he doesn't get brought up more is because he spent almost the entirety of his prime years with a bad Timberwolves franchise that didn't surround him with the talent necessary to consistently compete for championships. By the time he joined Boston, he was already a 13-year veteran who was just exiting the prime of his career. It's interesting how after all these years, Tim Duncan has been clearly elevated to the status of greatest power forward in NBA history, and deservedly so. But when him and KG were both in their primes, much of the NBA community, including myself, saw them as equals in talent. But now, in the modern day, you would be ridiculed just to put Garnett in the same sentence as Duncan. Sometimes, I have to wonder how much of that gap is a product of having one of the greatest coaches of all time and a career filled with Hall of Fame supporting talent. Again, not taking anything away from Duncan or Dirk for that matter, I'm just saying that I believe KG was much better than a lot of people realize. This next matchup is between two legendary point guards, Steve Nash and Jason Kidd. One of these floor generals spent his best years on the Phoenix Suns as the famous leader of their 7 second offense, while the other spent his prime years on the New Jersey Nets, leading them to be perennial contenders in the Eastern Conference. Starting with the basics, Steve Nash was a 6'3 point guard who typically weighed around 195 pounds. Jason Kidd was a 6'4 point guard who was usually around 205 pounds. We'll compare these two greats with five major categories. The categories are scoring, playmaking, rebounding, defense, and accolades, starting off with scoring. Both of these stars were certainly pass-first players, but they were also both very capable of getting a bucket whenever it was needed. Neither player ever won a scoring title, and neither player ever cracked the top 20 list in points per game on any given season. For his career, Nash averaged 14.3 points in the regular season, and his career high was 42 points against Jason Kidd and the New Jersey Nets in 2006, and he averaged 17.3 points over his career in the playoffs. On the other hand, Jason Kidd averaged 12.6 points in the regular season, and his career high was 43 points against the Rockets in 2001, and he averaged 12.9 points in the postseason. Neither of these players were ever considered as elite scorers. Before his contribution, Nash was about as reliable as they come, 
as he was a fantastic three-point shooter and mid-range shooter in transition. He was also one of the more underrated finishers around the rim, who deserves more credit than he's usually given. With his all-around soft touch, Nash made the 50-40-90 club four times, which is the most in NBA history. If that's not impressive enough, then consider this. Over an 11-season stretch from the 02-03 season to the 12-13 season, Nash had better than 50-40-90 percentages. In terms of offensive efficiency, it doesn't really get much better than that. On the other hand, not only did Kidd average fewer points, but he was never a very efficient scorer, shooting only 40% for his career, and although he eventually became a solid three-point shooter, for most of his career, he simply was not. He was also just a decent free throw shooter, compared to Nash, who was one of the greatest of all time. Simply put, Nash easily gets the edge in scoring. Next up is playmaking. This is the bread and butter of an all-time great point guard, and neither of these greats were any exception. For his career, Nash averaged 8.5 assists as he was fantastic at finding his cutters and his wide-open shooters. Nash absolutely loved to push the tempo, and he was certainly the main beneficiary of their 7-second offense. Nash led the NBA in assists per game on five separate occasions, which is tied for the fourth most of all time, trailing only Oscar Robertson, Bob Cousy, and John Stockton. The one major criticism that people usually make about Nash is that his stats were inflated by having Mike D'Antoni as a head coach in Phoenix, and that is certainly a decent argument. Between the ages of 22 and 29, before he joined the Phoenix Suns, Nash only averaged 6 assists per game. And in his 8 seasons in Phoenix between the age of 30 and 37, Nash averaged a whopping 10.9 assists per game. Although I understand the criticism, every player has certain preferences when it comes to systems, teammates, and coaches. Regardless of whether or not D'Antoni was the reason, Nash was successful in that situation. Now Kidd averaged 8.7 assists over the course of his career, which is just slightly higher than Nash's career average, and Kidd was certainly more consistent regardless of what team and coach he played for. Although Nash certainly loved transition basketball to a greater extent, that was an aspect that Kidd also enjoyed. And if I had to pick one specifically as a lob passer, Jason would be my choice. In this category, you really have to split hairs. So in conclusion, for this specific topic, it is a tie between the two players. Next up is rebounding. This is arguably the most one-sided category of them all. As a shorter player with a smaller frame, Nash was never looking to battle players on the boards and stuck mostly to the perimeter on defense. At his peak in 2006, he averaged 4.2 rebounds per game, and over the course of his career, he averaged an underwhelming 3 rebounds on a nightly basis. On the other hand, Kidd had a bit more size and strength to make his presence felt, as he had a career average of 6.3 rebounds per game, getting as high as 8.2 in 2007. This is the major reason why he finished his career with a grand total of 107 triple-doubles, which is tied with LeBron James for the fourth most in NBA history. Meanwhile, Nash only had a career total of three triple-doubles, which is very low because of his lack of rebounding. In short, Kidd easily gets the edge on the boards. Next on the list of categories is defense, and this one isn't even close either. Kidd was a great on-ball defender and a frustratingly good pickpocket, who averaged 1.9 steals over the course of his career. He was remarkably consistent, as he never had a season where he averaged fewer than 1.6 steals per game, which is why he's currently sitting in the second spot on the NBA's all-time steals list. Unlike Nash, Kidd had the size and strength to reliably guard shooting guards as well, frequently taking on the assignment of guarding the best in the game, like Kobe Bryant and Dwayne Wade. Over his career, Kidd made a total of 9 all-defense teams, which is tied with Gary Payton and Chris Paul for the most selections for a point guard in NBA history. Then we take a look at Nash, who not only never earned an all-defense team selection, but if we're being honest, he was a complete liability on that end of the court throughout his career. 
He didn't have the size or strength to compete with players in the post, and he didn't have the lateral speed to defend some of the quickest point guards in the league. These issues go all the way back to his college days, where his then head coach, Dick Davey, said that Nash was one of the worst defensive players that he had ever seen. That basically ends the topic right there. The defensive edge strongly goes to Jason Kidd. Last on the list of categories is accolades, and both of these guards were very proven in that area. Nash never won an NBA championship, but he was a back-to-back -back MVP winner in 2005 and 2006. He made a total of eight All-Star teams and seven All-NBA teams. He has five assist titles in his career, and over the course of his 18 seasons, he averaged 14.3 points, 8.5 assists, 3 rebounds, and 0.7 steals on a true shooting percentage of 60.5%. Kidd won the NBA championship as a role player for the Dallas Mavericks in 2011. He never won the league MVP, but he did make 10 All-Star teams and 6 All-NBA teams. Along with that, he made 9 All-Defense teams and earned 5 assist titles. In his 19 seasons, he averaged 12.6 points, 8 assists, 6.3 rebounds, and 1.9 steals on a true shooting percentage of 50.7%. In conclusion, I understand that Nash was the more efficient player by a mile, and simply one of the most efficient offensive players to ever live. But as far as playmaking goes, these players were very similar, and even with their offensive gifts considered, I simply refuse to ignore the defensive end of the floor. In basketball, there's only so many positions where you can allow a player to be a defensive liability before it starts to result in many losses and earlier eliminations. If I'm choosing to build a team starting with one player, I don't want to do it with a guy that many people consider as one of the worst defenders of all time, which is why I'm ultimately taking Jason Kidd, who will be a dominant two-way player on any given night. Today, our matchup is half-man, half-amazing Vince Carter versus the man known as T-Mac, Tracy McGrady. One legend built his legacy over a long-lasting career of 22 seasons, while the other played 15 seasons before his career was cut short due to injuries. Starting with the basics, Carter was listed as a 6'6 shooting guard slash small forward who typically weighed around 220 pounds. McGrady was listed as a 6'8 shooting guard slash small forward who weighed around 210 pounds. We'll compare these two greats with five major categories, which sometimes vary in categories depending on positions and play styles. In this video, for these two all-time great wings, the categories are scoring, playmaking, efficiency, defense, and accolades. First off, scoring. Both of these stars stood out as elite scorers in the league, as Carter is in 19th place on the all-time scoring list with nearly 26,000 points. He has no scoring titles in his career, and he had a career average of 16.7 points. His career high was 51 points against the Suns in 2000, and he averaged 18.1 points for his career in the playoffs. McGrady is in 71st place on the all-time scoring list with over 18,000 points. He has two scoring titles in his career, and he had a career average of 19.6 points. His career high was 62 points against the Wizards in 2004, and he averaged 22.2 points for his career in the playoffs. The similarities between these two greats go on and on, from the fact that they're two of the most athletically gifted players to ever play, to the fact that they're actually second cousins and once teammates in Toronto. Offensively, they were incredibly similar as well, as both players were incredible leapers and finishers above the rim. But although that's their most memorable and highlight-worthy traits, they were also so much more than just that. Both were terrific one-on-one -on -one scores with solid footwork, solid ball handling, and were each incredibly dangerous perimeter shooters. Now before you say it, I'm gonna say it. Comparing career numbers between these two legends can be somewhat misleading, considering how Vince Carter had a much longer and healthier career, playing over 500 games more than McGrady did. Although that increased the gap between their total points, it also hurts Carter when you compare their career averages, considering Carter played well into his 40s, which naturally tanked his career-long averages. We should give Carter credit, because being a durable player and staying healthy for a 22-year career is not easy to do, and that speaks to his incredible body and athleticism. With that being said, let's delve into their peaks a bit and discuss who was the better scorer when they were at their best. As I said before, both players had a very similar skill set. Now Carter's best season offensively was the 2000-2001 season where he averaged 27.6 points on 46% shooting. 
McGrady, on the other hand, was the 2002-2003 season, where he averaged a league-leading 32.1 points per game on 45.7% shooting. Not only did he have the better peak average, but he was also the more explosive scorer, as he had significantly more 40-point games and 50-point games than Carter did, despite the fact that he played 500 fewer games. Kobe summed it up pretty well when he described McGrady as the most difficult player he's ever had to guard. He said McGrady had all the skills and athleticism, but he was also 6'9". Now Kobe said 6'9", and McGrady is listed as 6'8", so I'll let you guys decide which is accurate. But regardless, the point remains the same. McGrady's size and length was a huge advantage, as he also had a tremendous 7'2 wingspan. If you value longevity significantly more than peak performance, then you can certainly make the case that Carter was the greater scorer. But for me, I'm a peak performance kind of guy, and at his best, Tracy McGrady was an all-time great offensively. Scoring goes to Tracy McGrady. Second up is playmaking. Now let's be clear, both of these greats had a clear preference of scoring the basketball, but that doesn't mean they weren't at least capable of facilitating. For his career, McGrady averaged 4.4 assists per game, much higher than Carter's 3.1 assists. Now before you assume that the latter half of Carter's career tanked his numbers, consider this. Carter only had one season where he averaged over 5 assists per game, which was the 2008 season with New Jersey. McGrady, on the other hand, had 7 seasons where he averaged at least 5 assists per game, including as high as 6.5 in the 06-07 season. T-Mac was a bit of an underrated passer, as his reliable court vision made him a dual threat on the court. Combine that with his elite scoring ability, and this really isn't much of a fight on this one. Playmaking goes to Tracy McGrady. Third up is efficiency. Now both scores were pretty similar in terms of shooting efficiency. In fact, both players actually have the exact same field goal percentage for their career at 43.5%. Carter's years in his late 30s and early 40s helped drop his field goal percentage, while McGrady's years dealing with back problems and numerous injuries dropped his efficiency as well. The key factor here is pure shooting ability, and that's an area where Carter has an advantage, as he was a slightly better three-point shooter than Tracy McGrady was. Now both guys were dangerous from distance and were capable of hitting perimeter shots even with a defender in their face but Carter was just a bit more reliable as he shot 37.1% from that distance for his career, compared to McGrady's 33.8%. This perimeter shooting skill of Carter's allowed him to be useful even in his later years as a role player, as he could help spread the floor since the defense could never comfortably leave him open. It also made him reliable down the stretch. In many situations where a three-pointer was needed, he quite often delivered. On top of all of that, he was also a more reliable free throw shooter, shooting 79.8% compared to McGrady's 74.6%. Efficiency goes to Vince Carter. Next up is defense. This was an area where neither player was ever considered among the elites of the league, as neither Carter or McGrady made a single all-defense team appearance. At their peaks, they had very similar numbers in terms of blocks and steals. Both incredibly electrifying athletes who could make a highlight defensive play at any given moment, but were just average on-ball defensive players. You could argue in McGrady's favor, considering he had the height and length on Carter, but really, that means nothing unless you do something with it. Whether it's from their career numbers, peak numbers, lack of defensive accolades, or just from what I remember on the eyeball test, it's really hard for me to make a distinction between the two. I'm interested to hear your thoughts in the comments if you have a different conclusion than me, but as for me, defense is a tie between these two wings. Last on the list of categories is accolades, and each of these legends had a few of them. Carter won zero league MVPs. He made eight all-star teams, two all-NBA teams, and was the 1999 Rookie of the Year. In his 22 seasons, he averaged 16.7 points, 4.3 rebounds, 3.1 assists, 1 steal, and 0.6 blocks on 53.6 true shooting percentage. McGrady also had 0 league MVPs. He made 7 all-star teams, 7 all-NBA teams, and won 2 scoring titles. He was also the 2001 most improved player. In his 15 seasons, he averaged 19.6 points, 5.6 rebounds, 4.4 assists, 1.2 steals, and 0.9 blocks on 51.9 true shooting percentage. Ultimately, despite their similarities, I don't think this comparison is all that close, but I can see you giving the nod to either player, all depending on how you look at it. 
If longevity is a huge factor for you, being able to stay healthy and impact the game over a long period of time, which translates to better career totals, then Vince Carter is the choice for you. But if you're like me and put more emphasis on who was the better player when they were in their prime, the guy who was able to more strongly impact the game in a variety of ways, then Tracy McGrady is your guy. That's why I personally select Tracy McGrady as the greater player on the all-time list. To me, when they were at their peak, McGrady was just the more dynamic player and brought more things to the table, and some things that weren't even covered among my selected categories, like how McGrady was a slightly better rebounder as well. It's hard to go wrong with either of these guys, as they were each some of the most exciting players to watch in all of NBA history. Let me know in the comments section who you think is the better player, Vinsanity or T-Mac. Today, our matchup is the big fundamental, Tim Duncan, versus the Black Mamba, Kobe Bryant. One legend built his legacy over a long-lasting career of 19 seasons with the San Antonio Spurs, while the other played 20 seasons with the Los Angeles Lakers. Two men who each have an argument of being the greatest player of their era. When you're comparing a shooting guard against a power forward or center, then the means in which you compare the two have to change. For example, it's normal for a guard to average more assists than a big man because of how much time the guard spends handling the ball, and he also does more of his passing from the perimeter, which is where most of the facilitating takes place. On the other hand, it's normal for a big man to average more rebounds considering his size and where he positions himself on the court. So what this means is that having categories like rebounding and playmaking would be pretty ridiculous considering the obvious advantages that are built into the different positions. So in this video, we need more general categories, and these are the four I've chosen for this comparison. Offense, Defense, Playoffs, and Accolades. First off, Offense. Fundamentally, these two players have an extremely different approach on the offensive end, as Duncan was more of the type to play within the flow of the offense. He didn't have to be the leading scorer to be extremely effective on his team. Kobe, on the other hand, had a much more aggressive tendency and even personality, and their differences showed on the court. Tim Duncan is currently in 15th place on the all-time scoring list with over 26,000 points, and he averaged 19 points per game over the course of his career on 55.1 true shooting percentage. Kobe is in 4th place on the all-time scoring list with nearly 34,000 points, and he averaged 25 points per game on 55% true shooting percentage, and he also won 2 scoring titles. When you simply look at their field goal percentage, Duncan had the advantage, which is expected from a big man. But when you take the other aspects into account, like perimeter shooting and free throw shooting, Kobe now has almost the exact same true shooting percentage as Duncan, despite the fact that he shot the ball nearly 50% more often than Duncan did. Analytics have proven that as you shoot the ball more, efficiency generally goes down, as more shot attempts means being less selective and results in taking more contested shots. Despite that, Kobe was a lot more efficient than people generally give him credit for, which is pretty incredible considering the fact that he took a lot of what Paul George would call bad shots. Duncan was never the dynamic scorer that Kobe was, but he didn't have to be, and that was somewhat the beauty of Tim Duncan's game, as he could fit with many different offenses and with many different personalities. These two were so uniquely different in the way they approached the game. I could break this category down for an hour, looking at all the different angles and perspectives, but for me, at the end of the day, Kobe has to take the offensive category, as he's one of the most dominant scorers of NBA history, and believe it or not, he was also an underrated passer. Of the players who scored at least 25,000 points in their career, the only players who accumulated more assists than Kobe did was Oscar Robertson and LeBron James. That's it. Offense goes to Kobe. Second up is defense. Both of these legends were two of the greatest defenders at their position. Neither player won a Defensive Player of the Year award, but they were both consistently elite and earned many All-Defense Team selections. Duncan has 15 All-Defense Team selections, which is the most in NBA history. For his career, he averaged 0.7 steals and 2.2 blocks. Kobe has 12 All-Defense Team selections and 9 First Team selections, which is tied with Michael Jordan, Gary Payton, and Kevin Garnett for the most First Team selections in NBA history. He averaged 1.4 steals and 0.5 blocks over the course of his career. Duncan in many ways was the model of consistency, and the biggest example of that was probably his defense, as he's the only player to make the All-NBA and All-Defense team for 13 straight seasons. Even as Duncan aged, and his reliability as a strong offensive threat dwindled, still his elite defensive presence remained. He wasn't the most athletically gifted player, but he had an incredibly high defensive IQ, and was a great team leader for a defensive-minded team. 
Duncan finished fifth on the all-time list in blocked shots, putting himself in the debate for the title of greatest rim protector to never win the Defensive Player of the Year. Now Kobe was elite too, especially in his early years in Los Angeles, and ask anyone on the 2008 Redeem team and they'll tell you about how Kobe's defensive tenacity, dedication, commitment, and leadership led that team to be as suffocating defensively as they could be. It was remarkable how throughout the majority of Kobe's career that he could use so much energy on offense while also remaining the best defender at his position. In 2006, Kobe became the only player to officially average over 35 points per game while also making first team all defense. He wasn't the type to lead the league in steals or blocks, but where he really stood out was with his on-ball defense, as Kobe was great at trapping his opponent, causing turnovers, and just generally making the offensive player frustrated, especially when Kobe put his mind to it in the most crucial situations. The thing is, Kobe didn't have the defensive longevity that Tim Duncan had. Even though the Mamba made 12 all-defense teams, which is just three short of Tim Duncan's total, even that 12 total is a bit questionable for Kobe. In an interview, the all-time great and brutally honest Phil Jackson said that Kobe won some of his later all-defense team selections because of his reputation, and not necessarily because of what he was actually doing on the court. In other words, Kobe's own Hall of Fame head coach said that his defense was a bit overrated, at least in terms of the later years of his career. As someone who personally witnessed more games from Kobe than any other player, I have to agree with this statement. As Kobe aged, it became much more common for him to get blown by by the offensive player and simply rely on the center or the help defender to bail him out. It wasn't that Kobe couldn't still be great defensively, it was just that he picked his spots rather than being a lockdown force all game long. Also consider the fact that Phil Jackson made this comment in 2010 and implied that this reputation thing had been going on with Kobe for a bit. So when did this reputation thing start? 2008? 2009? When you look at it that way, you're talking about around eight seasons of Kobe's career where he was not one of the best defenders. The same thing can't be said about the big fundamental. A slight edge on defense goes to Tim Duncan. Third up is the playoffs. When you're comparing some of the greatest players of all time, you have to factor in the postseason, as the game completely changes and the pressure, the nerves, and the magnitude of the moment reveal what players are really made of. Tim Duncan led the playoffs in total points two times, in blocks three times, and in rebounds six times. Over his 251 games in the playoffs, he averaged 20.6 points, 11.4 rebounds, three assists, and 2.3 blocks on 54.8 true shooting percentage. Kobe led the playoffs in total points four times and in steals two times. In his 220 playoff games, he averaged 25.6 points, 5.1 rebounds, 4.7 assists, and 1.7 steals on 54.1 true shooting percentage. Both players had postseason careers that were packed full with iconic moments. Both players had five championship rings, but when it comes to playoff comparisons, it's not really about the stats that drive the debate, but it's usually the narratives about the players. For example, people often criticize Kobe for quote, getting carried by Shaq to his first three championships. But as I've talked about in several videos before, that's because Shaq took advantage of the mismatches in the NBA Finals against the Eastern Conference. If we're being honest, the NBA champions were decided in the Western Conference playoffs in the early 2000s. And in two out of those three championship runs, it was Kobe who was arguably the MVP of the West playoffs, and in both 2001 and 2002, where Kobe's Lakers defeated Tim Duncan's Spurs, Kobe was the best performer for Los Angeles. Now some argue that Tim Duncan's final championship in 2014 was more as a role player than the best player on the court. And considering the fact that he was 37 and Kawhi Leonard was the finals MVP, there may be some validity to that claim. But as far as the best performance in an NBA Finals series, that definitely goes to Duncan in 2003 who put up absolutely ridiculous numbers in those six games against New Jersey, including a near quadruple double in the championship clinching game. In my opinion, Kobe's most impressive championship run came in 2010, where it wasn't so much about his solid playoff numbers, but it was more about the fact that he did it with a broken index finger on his shooting hand. These guys have so many postseason minutes that you can find instances where both guys played above expectations and below expectations. You can stir up any narrative to discredit either contender, but there's always a narrative-based counter-argument against the other player as well. In my opinion, both guys had equally impressive stats and achievements when the games mattered most. 
Playoffs is a tie between these two legends. Last on the list of categories is accolades, and both of these icons had a ton of them. Duncan was a 5-time NBA champion, and he won 3 finals MVPs. He was a 15-time All-Star, made 15 All-NBA teams, 15 All-Defense teams, and was a 2-time league MVP. In his 19 seasons, he averaged 19 points, 10.8 rebounds, 3 assists, 0.7 steals, and 2.2 blocks on 55.1 true shooting percentage. Kobe was a 5-time champion, and he won 2 finals MVPs. He made 18 All-Star teams, 15 All-NBA teams, and 12 All-Defense teams. He was the 2008 League MVP, and he won two scoring titles. In his 20 seasons, he averaged 25 points, 5.2 rebounds, 4.7 assists, 1.4 steals, and 0.5 blocks on 55 true shooting percentage. Ultimately, as usual in these videos, it's extremely close, and I don't think there's a wrong answer here, but just a matter of opinion and preference. But for me, Kobe Bryant is the greater basketball player and ranks higher on my all-time list. To boil it down as simply as possible, Kobe was simply the more dynamic and dominant offensive force, and to me, the advantage Kobe has over Duncan offensively is significantly greater than the advantage Duncan has over Kobe defensively. I do think there's a strong argument for Duncan, but if you make that argument, then I think it's mostly about stuff that goes beyond the stat sheet. For example, he was a quiet and humble leader who led by example. He's a teammate who's incredibly easy to get along with, which certainly isn't something that Kobe was known for. And Duncan sacrificed money on several occasions to allow his team to recruit more talent. Now I'm not one to suggest that any worker should take less money than what they're worth, but at the same time, Duncan's willingness to sacrifice some of his own potential income for the sake of the team just goes to show how his selflessness and team-first approach was so instrumental in all of the success that San Antonio experienced. So to reiterate, I think Kobe is literally the better basketball player. But if we're talking about who is the person you would rather have in the organization for everything they bring to the organization on and off the court, then Tim Duncan is likely the right choice. Let me know in the comments section who you think was the better player and who you would rather start your franchise with. Today, our matchup is the man known for his magic on the court, Irvin Johnson, versus Larry Legend, Larry Bird. Both legends spent the entirety of their career with one of the most prestigious franchises of NBA history. Magic played 13 seasons with the Los Angeles Lakers, and Bird played 13 seasons with the Boston Celtics. Magic was a 6'9 point guard who weighed around 215 pounds. Larry was a 6'9 small forward slash power forward who weighed around 220 pounds. Two men, who were each accredited with saving the NBA in the 1980s. Two men, who each have an argument of being the greatest player of their era. We'll compare these two greats with five major categories, which sometimes vary in categories depending on positions and play styles. In this video, for these two icons of basketball, the categories are scoring, facilitating, rebounding, defense, and accolades. First off, scoring. Magic Johnson was a much better scorer than people typically give him credit for, especially when you consider how he's one out of only two players to average over 10 assists per game for his career. Despite the fact that his number one priority was usually to get his teammates going, he still managed to consistently get his, as he averaged 19.5 points per game over the course of his career. He was a great finisher around the rim, and he managed to get himself more clean looks than most, since the defense always had to be on their heels because of his ability to find the open man. This led him to be extremely efficient throughout his career, as he shot 52% from the field over his 13 seasons, which is almost unheard of by point guard standards. He also was a tremendous free throw shooter, hitting 84.8% of his attempts over his career, and even led the league in overall free throw percentage in 1989. Now Bird on the other hand is immediately known for his scoring. He was also a 6'9 small forward with a high release point on his jumper, so contesting his shots was quite difficult. With his fantastic footwork, his underrated handles, his finesse around the basket, and lethal perimeter shooting, he averaged 24.3 points over the course of his career. He never led the league in scoring, but unlike Magic, he was right around the top of the list on several occasions. As far as perimeter scorers go, Bird has an argument for being the most efficient scorer in NBA history. He led the league in free throw percentage four times, and he also had two 50-40-90 seasons in his career, which is the second most in NBA history. The only player with more 50-40-90 seasons was the Hall of Famer Steve Nash, but Nash was never close to being a near 30 points per game scorer like Larry was several seasons. 
So the fact that Bird was able to maintain that efficiency as a perimeter score and at such a high volume of shots is pretty much unprecedented. Magic gets some bonus points for being a capable and efficient score even while being an all-time leader in assists. But even with that being said, it's still not enough to close the gap between him and the all-around the court threat that is Larry Bird. Scoring goes to Larry Bird. Second up is facilitating. Now I alluded to this in the previous topic, but Magic is arguably and probably considered by most as the greatest passer of all time. He has the highest assist per game average in NBA history at 11.2, and he led the league in assists four times. It's easy to simply look at the numbers and say that Magic was the best passer on his team, but he was so much more than just that. Magic was the engine that drove the Showtime Lakers high octane offense. Magic was obsessed with pushing the tempo nearly every time the Lakers gained possession, and it resulted in many easy buckets for his slashing teammates. His ability to make smart split-second decisions is unmatched, and his court vision would have you swearing that he has eyes in the back of his head with the passes he was consistently making. On top of all of that, he was a 6'9 point guard, so interfering with some of his higher passes was nearly impossible for many of his smaller defenders. Now Bird was a much better distributor than most people realize. He started his career as a power forward, and if he had remained in that position, then he would probably be known today as the greatest passing power forward of all time. He shared a similar ability to Magic in terms of their incredible court vision, and he's been praised by Magic on numerous occasions for that exact skill. He averaged 6.3 assists on his career, averaging as high as 7.6 in 1987. He was usually not among the assist leaders of the league, but he was consistently among the leaders at his position. The same way Magic got bonus points in the scoring category, Bird also gets bonus points in the facilitating category, as it was remarkable that Bird assisted his teammates as often as he did, when you consider the fact that Bird chose to shoot the ball nearly 50% more often than Magic Johnson did. Still, unless you're a gold medalist in mental gymnastics, facilitating clearly has to go to Magic, as his incredible ability to make his teammates better is simply one of a kind. Third up is rebounding. Now this one can be a little bit tricky since I'm making the case for different positions. One is typically more of a perimeter player, while the other plays more in the interior, and naturally, the advantage goes to the interior player where most rebounds are available, especially in an era like the 80s where less perimeter shots are taken. All things considered, Magic was a pretty good rebounder, especially by point guard standards. He successfully used his superior height and frame to his advantage over smaller guards, and he was often hungry to get the ball as quickly as possible so he could then push the fast break on offense. He averaged 7.2 rebounds over the course of his career, getting as high as 9.6 in 1982. Now Larry Bird averaged 10 rebounds per game over his career, getting as high as 11 in 1983. One thing no one ever questioned about Bird back then was his hustle and heart. It was common for him to play the game with a physical and tenacious approach, and doing so continuously with 100% effort. These are qualities that naturally benefit a player's ability to secure the boards. This has resulted in Bird having the 50th highest rebounds per game average in NBA history. Most of the players on that list are either primarily power forwards or centers though, which Larry was not. He played mostly as a small forward. Among primary small forwards, Larry has the third greatest rebounds per game average in NBA history. When you consider the positions, this one is extremely close, but for me, the slight edge goes to Larry Bird, not just because of his higher numbers, but it's about how he played to get those numbers, as Bird was known for a more grit and grind type approach, which is a great quality when you're banging for the boards in the 80s. Fourth on the list is defense. Magic was never considered as an elite defender, as he didn't make any all-defense teams in his career, but he was certainly a capable one. His sheer size made it somewhat difficult for opposing guards to score over him or to get into a favorable position with physicality. Magic had a high top speed that he always used on offense, but his lateral movement wasn't the quickest on defense, which made it sometimes difficult for him to stay in front of the quicker, smaller guards. His hands were decently quick, and he was pretty good at jumping the passing lanes, which resulted in him leading the league in steals twice, including the 1981 season where he averaged an incredibly strong 3.4 steals per game. He also averaged 1.9 steals over the course of his career, although he didn't have a strong vertical leap and was never a good shot blocker, as he only averaged 0.4 blocks over his career and never averaged at least one per game in a season, which is pretty surprising considering his height and length advantage over almost every opposing guard. 
Larry was known to be slow, and he wasn't the most quick or athletically gifted player, but I do think he's somewhat of an underrated defender compared to how he's perceived by the general public. The Boston Celtics were a consistently elite defensive team, and Bird's high basketball IQ was a significant help in that area. Bird made three all-defense teams and averaged 1.7 steals and 0.8 blocks over his 13 seasons. Bird could be a bit of a pest on defense, as his effort and tenacious attitude was never lacking. Due to his slower and less athletic frame, it wasn't uncommon for him to need help defensively if he was guarding some of the athletic and talented wings in the league, like Michael Jordan and Dominique Wilkins for example. With that being said, Bird was good at communicating with his teammates, trapping offensive players and forcing turnovers as a result. This one is somewhat close, but at the end of the day, Bird has the slightly better individual defensive numbers, he's the more accomplished defensive player, and he was the team leader of the consistently better defensive team throughout the decade. Defense goes to Larry Bird. Last on the list of categories is accolades, and both of these legends had a ton of them. Magic Johnson won five NBA championships, three finals MVPs, and he won three league MVPs. He made 12 all-star teams and 10 all-NBA teams. He was a four-time assist champion and a two-time steals champion. In his 13 seasons, he averaged 19.5 points, 7.2 rebounds, 11.2 assists, 1.9 steals, and 0.4 blocks on 61 true shooting percentage. Larry Bird won three NBA championships, two finals MVPs, and three league MVPs. He made 12 all-star teams, 10 all-NBA teams, and three all-defense teams. He was also the 1980 Rookie of the Year and was a two-time 50-40-90 player. In his 13 seasons, he averaged 24.3 points, 10 rebounds, 6.3 assists, 1.7 steals, and 0.8 blocks on 56.4 true shooting percentage. Based on this list, I think Magic has the slight advantage on accolades. Now as far as how these players compare as a whole, as usual, it's extremely close. And the only reason I'm picking between these two is because I have to for the sake of the series. But for myself personally, Larry Bird is the more complete player and ranks higher on my all-time list. I think most of the time, people rank Magic slightly higher because of his edge in championships over Bird. But you have to also consider that basketball is a team sport, and although both legends were blessed with a tremendous supporting cast, also keep in mind that the East was definitely the stronger conference throughout the 80s, which meant it was even more difficult for the Celtics to get to the NBA Finals in the first place. Although I do think Bird is the slightly better and more complete individual player, I do think there is a strong argument for Magic, but I think that argument goes beyond the stat sheet and leans more into the narrative that no one has ever made their teammates better than Magic Johnson did, which is probably true, and if that's enough for him to be your choice, then I respect that. Let me know in the comments section who's higher on your list, Magic Johnson or Larry Bird. Thanks for watching as always, make sure to like and subscribe for more basketball content, and I'll see you guys in the next video.